Hello everyone and welcome back to another art history video. So I don't know if you guys are big art history fans yourself. I'm sure you are if you're watching my videos or if you just like listening to me. But if you are a big art history fan, you for sure probably know of the magazine called Craft and Design. And it's really renowned for introducing new artists, new sculptors. It's mostly architecture and sculpture focused rather than fine art or 2D. But so my mom was actually an art professor, so we would get the mailing listing for these when I was younger. And I just remember there was this one issue. I can't remember exactly what year it was. I'm going to find it. But it was this one issue and the design cover was so incredible. I have it ripped out and taped on my wall back at home, my room at home, but basically this woman on this craft and design cover, I didn't know who she was, but after reading the article, I became very fascinated with her. And her name is Ruth Asawa. So Ruth Asawa was born in 1926 and she is most well known for this extensive body collection of wire sculptures that are known to challenge conventional notions of material and form with sculpture because she had this crazy idea of emphasizing on the lightness and transparency of sculptures rather than precise realism or accuracy. Ruth Aiko Asawa was born on January 24th in 1926 in Norwalk, California. Her parents were immigrants from Japan and she was actually the fourth of seven children and a majority of her time when she was younger was spent picking seasonal crops. They were, her parents were truck farmers because unfortunately at the time due to discriminatory laws against the Japanese from World War II her parents were not allowed to become American citizens or own land themselves. She actually unfortunately had to spend a part of her time in a Japanese internment camp as well in Rauer, Arkansas, where she was separated from her father for about 12 to 13 years. And I would say this portion of her life, as would anyone, had a huge impact on her, especially how she views her art forms and community building and how we will see later on how she dedicates herself to the good of the public art world. So following her release from the internment camp in 1943, Ruth actually went to go study at Black Mountain College in North Carolina, which was actually supposed to be a second place of education for African Americans that granted them an educational opportunity that wasn't really present during these discriminatory times. But the school was known for its very progressive pedagogical methods of avant-garde aesthetic movements at the same time while being very inclusive with their student demographic, which is obviously why Ruth was very drawn towards this. Her time at Black Mountain probably had a huge influence on her artwork, and she was influenced by a lot of her teachers, such as the artist Joseph Albers and Buckminster Fuller. This is also where she met her husband, Albert Lanier, and they would soon later get married in 1949, and she would raise a family with in San Francisco. They chose San Francisco, I personally think, because at the time it had such a huge, rich, vibrant art scene. And also, I'm sure San Francisco, compared to other places, was going to be a lot more accepting of an interracial couple, especially with a Japanese woman during these very, very harsh discriminatory times against Japanese Americans. Like I said before, Asawa's sculptures are instantly recognizable. They kind of have like this generous stature, always contrasted by very nimble web-like weaving and these very undulating curves. And her, this like state of the art sculpture formation that's so unique to her own body of artwork was actually inspired in 1947 during a trip to Mexico where Asawa recounts of witnessing local villagers constructing baskets using a wire looping technique. And upon returning to the United States, she kind of began experimenting with this technique and soon developed her signature sculptural style. She quotes, I like the idea that the relation between outside and inside was interdependent or integral. Also that you can use the same idea to make many different things. 
that appeals to me more than using many different ideas. Not only in these sculptures does the exterior become the interior and back again, but the material almost contains simultaneously the past and the future states. A lot of people and art critics kind of realize this as the ultimate metaphor for understanding Asamo's Japanese-American heritage. It's embedded in almost all of her work, especially with these sculptures, and at the same time is also always fluid, moving from one state to another while still remaining essentially itself within the entirety of the sculpture. Most of these times when she's projecting or showing these sculptures in museums or galleries, they are always suspended from the ceiling, where they kind of are able to capture this essence of a hovering between stillness and barely perceptible movement. The most famous quote I can recount from her kind of describing her own work is, quote, a line can enclose and define space while letting the air remain air. And this brings us to the exhibit, A Line Can Go Anywhere. And the sculptures were inspired by an experience of Ruth's childhood when she used to work on the farm of her parents. Asawa tells us that she used to sit on the back of a horse-drawn leveler and draw shapes in the sand on her parents' farm with her bare seat. She almost chooses to poetically describe her looped wire sculptures and their fascinating translucent qualities by writing, quote, I know I'm including so many quotes by her, but I don't know, I just seem like she's a very profound woman who has so many interesting things to say in an eloquent manner, so I feel like they're very important and integral to these sculptures. But she writes, quote, It is almost a woven mesh that is not like medieval chain mail. It is more like a continuous piece of wire. Forms enveloping inner forms, yet all forms are visible and transparent. And the shadow, if there's a light that casts a shadow upon the sculpture, the shadow will reveal an exact image of the object. Another huge famous piece done by her, I actually see this one all the time because um, I do go to school in Berkeley, so every time I go to SF, usually by the BART station, there is this piece, but she was dedicated to actually build the San Francisco Fountain to the city on Valentine's Day in 1973. The fountain is situated right outside Hyatt Hotel in Union Square, and if you look very closely, the work contains many intricate and very surprising details. Another really important detail or part of a detail that is super integral to Asawa's career and her legacy is showing the Alvarado Elementary School. This is actually a place where Ruth established an arts program and actually helped or encouraged her students to help contribute to the work on some of the small pieces of the fountain. The material that Ruth Asawa used for the base, the mold of the fountain, is actually the same clay that she made for many children due to her work as an arts activist in public school and she makes the clay um, using baker's clay which is a little bit surprising because it's not really it's not really a professional medium it's usually more so used for children like play-doh for juvenile entertainment purposes but i think she wanted to use especially this very easy medium to work with because she wanted these children to be a part of it. She wanted it. She wanted a medium that would be easier for children to experiment and work with and contribute to this piece. Another thing about the sculptures that I mentioned previously that are also so integral to her art legacy is the fact that she uses this very simple wiring for her sculptures. And a lot of people could say, yes, it was inspired by the town that she visited when she was in Mexico. But what's interesting is a lot of the times in her sculptures, she actually had her own children help her. She was a huge person of community organization. She always advocated for community and arts and collaboration. So she always wanted to use a medium like a simple wire where children could experiment with it and get their hands on it and be introduced to this vast world of art and creative expression. I would say she very much strongly defined this kind of post-war aesthetic expression, especially as an Asian American woman, which is something that is so incredibly important for her to hold this recognition and representation in the art community at the time. She became a member of the National Endowment for the Arts Task Force on the Education and Training of Artists. I think I respect especially Ruth Asawa so much because the majority of her art career, yes, she made these incredible sculptures that are recognized to her name, 
But the majority of her life legacy, she dedicated to bettering the art community for a public good, for the younger generations and advocating for this collective triumph of creativity. And her advocacy was not only self-centered on herself, like, oh, like, I'm building my own brand name, this is my identity, my art. Her advocacy was always focused on other individual artists in small arts organizations or nonprofits where small amounts of money could do great deals of good for the community. In 1982, she actually focused her energy on building a public high school for the arts in San Francisco. And she located it in the heart of Civic Center so that it was very close to, at the time, the city's world-class cultural organizations such as opera, ballet, and jazz. The school was actually renamed for her, and it is actually now called the Ruth Asala San Francisco School of the Arts. To finish off this beautiful, incredible, important woman's legacy, she tells us in an interview, quote, I was interested in the economy of a line, making something in space, and closing it without blocking it out. It's still transparent. I realized that if I was going to make these forms, which interlock and interweave, it can only be done with a line because a line can go anywhere. I think this quote is something that so meticulously embodies not only her physical work, her sculptures, but also how she chose to contribute the entirety of her life for the public good as an artist. Beyond San Francisco city limits, her legacy in modern art is still very impactful and enduring and today her work is found in permanent collections of numerous museums across the country. She was a pioneering post-World War II modernist whose work has been able to transcend multiple barriers that she unfortunately had to face as an Asian American woman artist with traditional craft materials and techniques. She was able to live to see all these confining categories within the art world in design, as well as societal barriers, kind of challenged and redefined, and I think it's really beautiful to know that she was a huge contributor to this. As someone who's very into art history and I see all these former artists, especially Asian American artists and writers like Teresa Hakyung Chan, Ruth Asawa, living in the Bay Area, cultivating this art world, I don't really see that anymore, especially with this overtake of tech and work culture. And I don't know, it's a little bit disheartening to say at the least a lot of institutional failures going on in San Francisco. I don't know, it's just, I guess, side note, it's like really interesting to see firsthand how the culture of the Bay Area is evolving. And I really hope you take something from this video, learn something new about a new artist, because that's always my goal with this channel. Thank you everyone for watching, and please watch for my next video, because it will be coming up soon, because I'm gonna be on break soon. Just, I have to get through finals. But, thank you for watching! Bye!